Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So welcome back. Um, I'm Desney Tan. I work here at Microsoft Research, and I run a couple of um, hu human-computer interaction groups, both in Redmond but also in Beijing, China. Um, it's my pleasure today to, to host this session. Um, we've got a couple of stellar speakers coming up to talk about NUI, natural user interfaces. Um, now, NUI is sort of an interesting term in that it means lots of different things to lots of different people. Um, it's everything from um, novel interaction to contextual computing to, interact to, to intelligent interfaces um, to sensors and devices and so on and so forth. Um, I don't think we're going to probably settle on a definition of NUI, but what we're going to try to do with this panel is to provide a couple of different perspectives um, from folks both around the company, so a couple of folks from Microsoft Research, a couple of folks from our product teams, um, and then an academic. Um, and then um, we'll run it as a panel. And so the format we'll use is that each speaker will get between 10 and 12 minutes to come up and present their point of view. Um, we'll hold on questions until the end. Um, and we'll save um, probably 20 or 30 minutes at the end for, for a Q&A and audience interaction se session. Um, so queue up your questions. Make sure you have enough of them ready to poke and prod at the various presenters at the end of this. We've got the beautiful um, chairs up here that they'll all come up and sit at. Um, but let me introduce the first presenter. So Daniel Wigdor is um, a UX experience architect with a Windows team, but he also spends a lot of time hanging out in Microsoft Research. So he's sort of a half and half kind of guy. Um, Daniel's been ins instrumental in ar orchestrating a bunch of the new e initiatives throughout the company, uh, most notably with Surface, as you guys saw from the last session. Um, Daniel would like to be introduced as a future best-selling writer. Uh, um, um, he's also, you know, if, if this feels like deja vu, he's, he's one of these guys that's fairly overcommitted during the faculty summit, so you'll continue to see him up here. So if it feels like you've seen him up here, um, he, you know, you probably have. Um, he does guarantee me that the content is new. He, he does have a lot to say. Um, but without further ado, Daniel Wigdor. Thank you. Oh, wow. wow. Well, and since Desney gave me a chance to plug the book, oh, yes, Pat, if you could lead a wave, that'd be awesome. Uh, I will mention that Brave Newy World, the construction of gestural user interfaces we published by Morgan Kaufman at the end of the year. All right. Now, what do I have to do to, let's say that, right? That looks like me. Nope. Which one am I? Six. This is what we call a natural user interface. OK. So thank you very much again. And uh, it's good to see so many friendly faces. And uh, Stevie Batish, who I think is going to start throwing things if anyone uses the word natural. So we'll try to avoid that. So I'm going to start this off with a question. What was the first use of a GPS-like system in aviation? What decade? Any guesses? Heard 1990s. I didn't hear that. 20s? It's not fun if you tell the punchline. <laughs> it was the 1920s. So there, in the 1920s, there was an effort across the United States to label uh, geographic features, oops, to label geographic features so that people who were flying around in their aircraft could find out uh, where they were going. And this sort of amusingly, just to put it in the context of its time, was touted as a job creation program. You could get a merit badge as a scout with this. Uh, it was a commercial welcome mat. And this was finally an opportunity for women to participate in aviation. So just to give you a sense of how long ago uh, this, uh, this took place. What we see here is clearly an idea that predates the technology that makes it truly useful. And so what we're seeing now at Microsoft and a lot of other companies and in the research community uh, for a long time now is the availability of technologies that are able to take old ideas and make them a reality and to, take, uh, to make them a reality in a way that is accessible to consumers. Now, to start off our debate on what uh, 
natural user interaction means. I, I like to say natural user interface just to keep up the, the string of disagreement. One of the definitions that I encounter a lot in my work at Microsoft is the idea that natural means innate. That if we can somehow just increase the bandwidth between the person and the computer, that there will emerge an interaction style that we won't actually have to design. And that we're just looking to unlock this ability for the computer to behave more like a person. And I blame Alan Turing for this vision of computing to an extent. And you know, we've all, I think, encountered that work before. But what I really want to sort of get out of the way right now is this idea that there is an innate way of interacting with the computer. And I'm going to do that by showing someone else's uh, great work. They asked the question, what are the natural gestures? So this was for a surface computing-like device. And they wanted to know, well, if there are natural gestures that exist, how can we find out what they are? What will users do in a gestural interface without being uh, prompted? And so they designed an experiment uh, that looked like this. This is Morris et al. Uh, from CHI 2008, I think. And they brought participants into a room and they showed them a before picture like this. And this wasn't an interactive system. They just showed them a picture and said, here's what the screen looks like before you did your gesture. Now I'm going to show you what the after picture is. And you tell me what gesture you would do to get from before to after. And the idea was that we could collect, or they could collect, all of these uh, user responses and then just make that the interface. And this comes from classic work in uh, user-defined interfaces, UDI. So I'm going to run the same experiment with you in the room here right now. Here's the before and here's the after. What gesture would you do to get from before to after? Everyone does, except Fogarty <laughs> and Dietz. <laughs> this is also the smart ass test. <laughs> but we had almost 100% agreement that we'd sort of you know, grab something in the bottom corner and, and thrust it up into, the, uh, up into the right. All right, so we've got one. One user-defined gesture that is natural, and everyone will do it without prompting. Let's try another one. Here's the before, and here's the after. So we've got a copy. You've copied the object. What gesture would you do to go from before to after? <laughs> now Fogarty's doing the. It's James. He's always about five minutes behind everyone. Okay, so Andy's doing a pin down and grab something off. Saul's doing a double tap. So the gesture that you're doing. <laughs> I'll let James sort of finish what he's OK. So um, the gesture that each of you is doing might make sense to you. But what we saw, if you were looking around the room, is that there wasn't a large amount of agreement on what that gesture should be. Now, we might be able to take one. And I'll take the one that uh, Andy Van Dam proposed, which was we'll pin something down and, and grab it off, which um, we'll sort of use that. Now, here's the next one. This is the last one. Here's the before, and here's the after. And this is the color blindness test. What gesture would you do to go from before to after? Touch it and say red. Touch it and say red. OK. We've got some swirlies. All right. So what we see and what they found in their work, and this is straight out of their paper, is that if, if the vertical axis is agreement and the horizontal axis is uh, task or action, there is exactly one gesture that we had 100% agreement on. And that gesture is moving something from one place to another. So we could argue that that's our natural gesture, and we build our natural user interface around this one action. You grab something, and you move it from one place to another. Now, it does turn out that we have designed a user interface that is based around that one action before. So this is from uh, the Xerox star, and this is, you know, one point along the history of the Windows icons, menus, and pointers uh, GUI. But it, too, is based on the single action, that and poke. Right? And no one did poke for any of the uh, gestures that I proposed. So it's even slightly more complex. But one perfectly reasonable theory is, well, we've got this new technology that allows us to put a lot more information to the computer. But why don't we just use the existing interface? What's wrong with a Windows icons, menus, and pointers approach? Well, here's a, an image from. Um, I think this is Princeton University. And they have, like many schools, a large high-resolution display wall. And you, know, you can see the um, professor there leading a conversation. Now, if we had a WIMP-based user interface on this, and we would just use a touch system to interact with it, it starts to look, well, a little bit like this. This is from the SkyMall catalog. It's where I do most of my Christmas shopping. 
And this isn't a touch system, but this is something that you can buy from the SkyMall catalog system, and it's a, it's a poster that you can hang on your wall. And you look at this and you think, well, you know, I, you know, I might have a daughter, and she might be really excited if I bought this thing, and she'll like me more, and so I'll buy the, buy the poster. But then you stop and think about it a little bit longer, you think it's a really good thing that she's excited to do a report on Argentina. <laughs> right, what would the user interface look like if, uh, if it weren't that? So what we start to realize is that new technologies and new interaction methods, new input methods, require a reassessment of our conventions and require a new uh, user interface. And so what we sort of get intuitively is that if the classic mouse-based interface is the sort of low bandwidth communication between person and computer, then we, with these new technologies, we can increase that bandwidth. But if we do it wrong, then we're going to get a terrible way of interacting with the system. And so what we're really talking about with Nui is fundamentally, from the beginning, redesigning user interfaces and doing it in a way that suits the context of the technology. This is my work in Photoshop, by the way. I'm very proud of it. So. All right, so how do we do that? Well, I propose a shift in thinking for natural user interfaces. When I talk to teams around Microsoft about it, I say don't think of it as a natural user interface, a user interface that is natural, but instead think of it as an interface that is meant to make your user feel like a natural. So when they use your interface, they should feel the way Michael Jordan feels when he's holding a basketball. One way that we might create that experience is to follow Jacob's work and use reality-based interfaces. And that's the underpinning for a lot of the other work in Nui. But I propose that we can take the advantages of that approach and break them down and build a new user interface. So I'm going to show you now is a design deck that uh, I and a colleague have used to talk about Nui to various teams across the company. And we claim that we have a set of simple principles that will yield a natural user interface. I'm going to share them uh, with you now. The first is this idea that we need our users to suspend disbelief. When you're interacting with a WIMP system, you don't actually believe that there's a physical button that you're pushing, but you accept the internal consistency of the system. To enable a suspension of disbelief, we can take lessons from the film world and the game world and learn how to create internally consistent uh, systems. The number one takeaway, and I'll use the term pitfall, the number one uh, mistake that you can make in designing this interface is failing to be internally consistent. So if you say that Superman can leap tall buildings in a single bound, it's important that his ability to do that is consistent across the uh, film. And it's those moments that the really super geeks of the world will jump on and create books like this. Who here is familiar with the Nitpicker's Guide for Star Trek books? I'll sort of confess my sin to my friends in the room. This was my first publication. I'm cited in this book. <laughs> so what we find with this is that you just need to be internally consistent with your approach, and you'll accomplish your goal. And so what we find is that if we create something that is authentically digital, and I'm not going to define that term, but we're going to create a new world that requires a suspension of disbelief and does not necessarily just mimic the real world. The next principle that we're trying to enable is content is the interface. This idea that what we're trying to do is to get rid of user interface elements and allow people to interact with their content. And we're, this isn't necessarily visually getting rid of it, but you can start to sort of intuitively understand uh, what that might look like. Now, you know, there's a lot of interface and there's a lot less interface. You start to see the appeal of visual designs like the one on the right when we allow users to get directly into their content and take away um, user interface handles. The la I've only got one minute left, and so I'll say the last principle that we try to apply is that learning is fun. And so what we want to dispel is this notion that it's important that all user interfaces be walk up and use. Some of them need to be walk up and use. And it turns out if your cell phone can't, you can't accomplish certain things with your cell phone within the first minute, the people will take it back. But it's OK to have a learning curve on your system. And to understand how to do that, we look to uh, people who are great at designing learning systems. I discovered recently, I'm sure many of you knew this already, that games like Super Mario Brothers, the first nine tenths of the game is just a tutorial to get you to understand the way to play it so you can play level 10. And so we see ideas like, uh, we put the block just high enough, and so we say, well, I must need to jump in order to reach that. Is there a way that I can jump? The first um, 
uh, tunnel there is high enough that I can jump without having to run, but the next one I have to run, and so on. And so you use a, a concept called scaffolding to build the user up to understand. And so what we get from all of this is this notion that while we might look to nature and reality to create a set of rules that will meet all of those, what we can also do is take as our design goal that we're trying to make an interface that will allow the user to feel like a natural and build all of the elements that I just described into our technologies. That's what I got. Thank you. Sorry, Steve. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, as I mentioned previously, we're going to hold off on questions till the whole panel's gotten through and we can bring them all up and so we can poke and prod at them all at the same time. Um, let me introduce our next speaker who's around here somewhere, Dan Morris. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I thought I lost a speaker. So, so Dan is also a researcher um, in Microsoft Research and um, arguably one of the, the most awesome groups in Microsoft Research. Um, I'm a little biased, of course, because he uh, works in my group. Um, so Dan's got an interesting background. He started off as a um, neurobiologist after which he spent some amount of time working in implantable brain um, electrodes um, in, in both primates but also humans. Um, he did simulation and physical and, and haptic rendering um, for his graduate work. And mo most recently, he's been working on computational creativity, um, healthcare, as well as the work he's going to describe today on physiological interfaces for computers. Part time rock star, full time researcher, Dan Morris. That's me. I'll take that. Uh, can somebody. Thank you. Somebody in the back want to give me a hint about this screen is all dark and sad. Can somebody give me a hint about how to bring PC5 up? Or just make it magically happen? That would be cool, too. I d oh, I didn't have to do anything. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk today about on-body sensing for always available interaction. And I'm going to start with a, um, a late-breaking research result from the brilliant minds of Microsoft Research after much careful consideration we have discovered that computers are smaller than they used to be. I know this will shock a lot of people in this room. Now, of course, this is a trend we're all familiar with. There's a lot of people in this building who have helped make this trend possible. We have seen our computers go from giant mainframes to medium giant desktops, then from desktops to laptops, uh, and most recently from laptops to super mobile devices. And when I'm using the word computer here, I'm going to loosely talk about uh, what, what people would be willing to call their primary computing device. Um, and so this is kind of this most recent transition in what I'm calling a computer. Uh, and I'm going to hypothesize this is a lot different from an interaction perspective than all of those previous transitions. What's really interesting about this particular transition is that finally uh, the uh, mobility has brought us to a, the desire for mobility has brought us to a point where the physical devices we call computers are actually smaller than these super awesome, super efficient interfaces we've built for a long, long time. So we're actually willing to pay a price. Uh, in efficiency and in some ways in usability to have mobility and to have computing in more scenarios. Um, so it's really interesting now as we, you know, everybody believes we can keep making things smaller. I don't have to convince anybody about that. As we keep going forward along this, uh, this curve of smaller size, for the first time I would say if we keep going the way we're going, we're actually also riding downhill in terms of efficiency and usability. And that's actually kind of a new space. Um, so of course this is the billion dollar question, what's next? And we want to think about what this means from an interaction perspective. So I'm going to use, I told Patrick I was going to steal a figure from him with, with credit. Uh, I think Patrick has this great figure from a recent paper that just kind of a, a vision of what computers might look like in a couple of years. And it's perfectly plausible from an engineering perspective that this thing we call a computer, that is whatever you call your primary computing device, could be the size of a watch, the size of a button, the size of a ring. So again, as we ride this slope down in size, now I say we're also riding this slope down in terms of efficiency. What does it even mean? We've really gotten used to using our hands to interact with computers. What does it even mean to use your hands to interact with something that's so much smaller than your hands? And so this brings me to the question I maybe want you guys to walk away with for now. What are the right interaction paradigms that we need to develop, because they're not there yet, for these super tiny but always available computers? Now interaction, of course, is both about input and about output. Really, for this little talk, I'm going to talk mostly about input paradigms for these super tiny, always available computers. It doesn't mean output isn't important. It just happens that our research area is more focused on input. And I'll touch briefly on output later. So what I want to do is just quickly lay out a kind of a way of thinking about different solutions to this problem, talking about a couple other things going on uh, around the research community, and then do a little bit of a deep dive on our work uh, in this space. 
So how are we going to solve what we'll call this micro input problem? Things are too small to interact with with our hands in the way we've always thought about it. Solution number one, we can, all right, we don't have a lot of space. Let's make better use of what little space we have now. Uh, and so Patrick Bodish has done some great work in this space. Devices have gotten so small that we can no longer really touch the front of them. Let's make better use of the back of them because we still have that. That's one example of how we can make better use of what little space we have. Patrick has also said, hey, if we can't, uh, we can't get the resolution we like using conventional sensors. Things are super small. Let's just jack that sensor precision up by using uh, smarter sensors, like, for example, in his recent paper, uh, looking at uh, optical sensing of fingerprints in order to increase touch resolution. Another approach to solve this micro input problem that folks are working on. All right, forget about touching the device. We give up. It's too small. Let's turn the environment around the device into our input surface. So Harrison and Hudson from WIS 2008 presented a system called Scratch Input, for example. Whatever you put your device down on, again, it's too small to actually interact with. Let's turn, using uh, acoustic sensing, let's turn the table or the desk that you put it down on into a gesture sensing surface. So that's one way we might appropriate the environment around us. Optics are, of course, another way we might appropriate space around the device that are too small. So the side site project from Microsoft Research is optical tracking to effectively expand the interaction space for a device of a given size. Another way of solving this micro input problem, and another thing I want everybody to walk away from for discussion later, speech is, I think, always kind of the elephant in the room when we talk about this natural user interface. I think everybody is huge uncertainty in our community this, and passionate dis disagreement about what the role of speech will be in this long-awaited natural user interface. So much uncertainty on where transcription quality will be and on what the social acceptability of search will be. So I'm not going to give you the answer, but everybody's homework for all of us is what, what do we all think about the role of speech in the ultimate natural user interface? Uh, and lastly, the one I'm going to go into a little more deeply is kind of what our research approach has been here. Uh, we suggest, hey, an another way of solving this micro-input problem is by turning our own bodies into the interface. It turns out we walk around with this giant input surface that we know pretty well. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we could actually turn our bodies into the interface for these super tiny computers? I'm not going to tell you this is better. I'm not going to say here are the drawbacks of all the approaches I presented on the other slides. Here's why our work is awesome. I was going to say this is another compliment. Anybody who tells you that is, is trying to sell you a sensor. I'm going to tell you this is a, another complementary approach to the sensors we've seen before. I'm going to talk real quick about two technologies we've developed in this space, one based on electrical muscle sensing and one based on mechanical sensing. Uh, and both of these are going to take the form, hey, we saw that medical science is good at something, so we're going to steal that technology and use it for interaction. Medical science has gotten really good over about 200 years at analyzing electrical muscle signals. Uh, this is, we call this electromyography. It has all kinds of applications in prosthetics, in rehab, in diagnostic medicine. We had, uh, approached this space and said, hey, medicine has learned a lot about muscle physiology and sensing. Can we apply this to interaction? Uh, so this is kind of our vision of what the muscle computer interface might look like in the future. Maybe in 2015, when you get up in the morning and you put on your ring-sized computer, you also slide on your muscle computer interface armband. And as you walk throughout the day to check your mail uh, and make phone calls, et cetera, you are gesturing with your hands uh, and we're able to sense that activity using electrical muscle sensing in this armband. Um, so we started in this space by literally stealing even the equipment that medical science has built for us. Uh, and we said, can we use the equipment that medical science uses to sense electrical muscle activity to classify finger motions? Um, so a couple years ago, this was uh, work mostly done by Scott Saponis, who was an intern here in our group as a PhD student uh, at the University of Washington. Uh, and we started with the same clinical systems you would get if you went to the doctor for a diagnostic EMG. Uh, this equipment, we turn, turned out, of course, this is the punchline is yes, we were able to classify finger movements. Um, and it was all well and good, except for all the goopy gel we had to put on and all the wires sticking off of it and the $15,000 amplifier that made it a little less plausible for consumer scenarios. Since this is a 12 minute talk, I don't have time to go into the next couple years of algorithms and engineering. But of course, our goal was to take the classification success here and make a more practical scenario out of it. So I'm going to skip kind of right to the punchline. No boring percent corrects. And just to give you kind of a feel for where we're at, I'm going to show you a quick video that gives you the kind of mm, touchy feely sense of how, where our classification accuracy and our practicality is at. So here, the rock star intern I mentioned, Scott Saponis, is um, demonstrating he's wearing a muscle sensing armband with electrical sensors, where they're basically just metal discs uh, on each arm. Uh, and using that, we're able to classify the gestures he's making with his finger and hand. And so our official scientific description of our accuracy is that it's equal to 100% at the easy level of Guitar Hero. Reviewers don't, 
like that description, so we use more traditional percent correct metrics in our papers. But that, I think it gives you a pretty good feel where we're at. I'll talk one more in, in a second about where we're going with this. I'm going to move on to one more sensor I'm going to talk about. Medicine also learned a long time ago, as many of you know who have ever had a stethoscope touched against your body, that the body is a complicated but useful transducer of mechanical information. And we want to ask again, hey, medicine has this all figured out. Can we leverage this for interaction and input? I'm going to show you a video. This is, again, a video featuring one of our rock star former interns, Chris Harrison, who was an intern here when he did this work and is a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon. Um, this is what it looks like when Chris taps on his arm. It's the same it would look like, mostly, if you tapped on your arm. Now you're going to see a slowed down version of this video where you can see mechanical impulses rippling along his arm. And what you can't see is even more mechanical impulses rippling inside his arm, along the bone. And what we want to ask, of course, is this phenomenon is really clear. Medicine has learned how to sense this. Can we actually use this to classify input? And in particular, when we do taps like that on our arm, can we figure out where we're tapping and use that as an input device? Um, so we developed this uh, sensor that's a, this kind of sensing armband prototype that contains a package full of the sensors you see on the bottom. You can think of them as one-dimensional accelerometers. They are, in fact, the sensor that tells you when your washing machine has an uneven load because it's rocking all over from side to side. We put a bunch of those in a prototype armband. And now we're asking, can we look at the signals that arrive there when I tap on my arm to uh, classify uh, hand gestures? Again, I'm not going to do any kind of boring percent correct. So I'm going to skip right to a video that gives you kind of, uh, eh, here's about where we're at feel for our classification accuracy. You're going to see Chris slide this armband prototype on. Going to get a quick feel for what these signals look like. This, each horizontal line here is the response at one of those little washing machine sensors. A uh, quick feel for what it looks like when you tap different locations. You don't need a fancy support vector machine to see that things look different when you tap at different parts on your arm. And last but not least, you're going to see Chris playing a game of Tetris and doing quite well by tapping different locations on his hand. Uh, and mechanical energy propagates up his arm, and we can sense that at this armband. So that kind of, again, gives you a quick feel that's about where our classification accuracy is at. One quick nod to the output problem that I told you wasn't really the uh, focus of our research. Um, this are, has been about input so far. Really, any time you walk around in the world in 2015 with your awesome sensing armband on, you're going to need some kind of output. A lot of feedback in the future might come through your Bluetooth headset. Uh, we've also uh, built some prototypes where we couple this sensing system uh, with a shoulder-mounted projector. Uh, so now you could imagine, with the same sensing apparatus and a projection apparatus, now you really uh, could, uh, could see your body as an always available interaction device, where interaction is really input plus output. Uh, so same sensing paradigm here, and you see users interacting uh, with both an output display surface and the same sensing surface. So again, that gives you kind of a quick feel where we're at, where we're going now. Of course, you saw both of those prototypes. One of them has giant wires hanging off of them. One of them, in fact, you couldn't tell this from the video, but if you blow on it wrong, it's going to fall apart and never run again. Next question we really want to ask, if we talk about wearing this all the time when you get up in the morning as your primary computing paradigm, we need to build a prototype that's going to allow us to ask questions, like what does it even mean to interact with this all day? That's kind of what we're working on now, is putting these sensors, along with others that have been explored in the literature, like accelerometers, together into something that will really allow us to explore those questions. And that, I'm going to sign off there, I think, for time. Thanks, Dan. Yep. Um, again, queue up your questions for the end, and I will get Scott Hudson, who's our next speaker, up on deck. You don't want to go next? Sorry. So Scott's a professor in the Human Computer Interaction Institute at Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University, where he served as founding director um, up till fairly recently. Um, Scott's a member of the CHI Academy, the Computer Human Interaction Academy, um, and has been amazingly active in the domain, publishing um, prolifically um, and serving on various uh, boards and committees. Um, one of the reasons Scott's up here is uh, not, not just because he's smart and has thought hard, long and hard about these problems, but that he has trouble saying no to stuff, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> which I've known for a while. Uh, um, so that, that's why. Okay, <laughs> take it away, Scott. <laughs> OK, great. Um, well, today we've seen natural interfaces talked about in a lot of different ways and meaning a lot of different things. And I wanted to think a little bit about what uh, we can do in terms of a research agenda that actually cross cuts this. Um, so it might seem that we have too much diversity here, and it's hard to uh, pin down a particular research agenda. 
But in fact, I think there is a good bit of commonality or there's at least some common threads and see themes across things that we've seen today from sort of the, um, the um, 3D sensing stuff we saw this morning, tables, the stuff that we've just seen now. Uh, there are common themes and issues. And I want to point at one of those, dive down on it very quickly, that really cross cuts all of them. And that is uncertainty. Uh, in natural, when we talk about natural interfaces, in fact, uncertainty really abounds. Uh, we are one of the things that's very different about these interfaces compared to interfaces that we've dealt with before is that we suddenly have to deal with uncertainty. And it comes at us from a number of different directions simultaneously. And I'm going to claim a little bit that it's unavoidable. And it's also something uh, from a research perspective that we don't know a lot uh, about how to deal with, at least in a general sense. Okay. So it comes at us from several different directions. One direction is that we have a lot of new input devices and sensors that we've seen. Okay. And uh, certainly in the early days, uh, these sensors tend to be not fully refined. They are engineered to a certain level, but they aren't necessarily fully there yet. They certainly haven't been through uh, sort of uh, full evolutionary cycles. And even uh, when things are quite uh, refined as sensors, we are actually dealing with working with a much richer underlying uh, data sources. We're not talking about trying to get two numbers out of a mouse very accurately. We're talking about dealing with something like a depth camera that has many, many numbers simultaneously that is just dealing with a lot richer data. And in the end, that's going to produce a lot of uh, additional noise at one level uh, and just flat out uncertainty of what we're seeing at another. Okay. Um, but even if we were able to create uh, highly refined sensors, and the sensors are getting better and they're going to get much better, um, almost everything that we've seen talked about in terms of natural interaction involves recognition. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, recognition is hard. Okay? It's not the case that you can go directly from the sensor to doing something useful with that. You almost always have to put it through some kind of a recognition process. And in fact, recognizers uh, don't have the same kind of properties that our other input devices have. Good recognizers uh, are often something that runs at 95% accuracy. Well, what does that mean? That means we're wrong 1 in 20 times. Now think about what that means. Think about, well, OK, suppose I, I, uh, I got an event that said the right mouse button went down, but that was wrong 1 in 20 times. What would that do to our interfaces? It would destroy them. Another way to look at it is if we're getting uh, a signal 10 times a second, we're going to have an error uh, every two seconds. <laughs> okay. uh, this is fundamentally uh, different and hard. Okay. And, it's, uh, the, and I would claim that the, you know, the hardness of this really involves uh, the uncertainty that's there. All right. Finally, well, let's suppose we somehow managed to get, uh, make perfect recognizers. Not likely to happen. I'll say it's probably not going to happen at all. I still want to claim that uncertainty is important to us because it is really central to the way in which human beings operate. So human-to-human -human interaction is something that you've heard held up in various places as a model for natural uh, interaction. Um, but if you look at what really happens with human uh, behavior, in particular human to human behavior, it is chock full of ambiguity and uncertainty. And so in fact, I want to claim that there's a good bit of uh, intrinsic uncertainty in naturalness, okay? and in particular in human to human interaction. And one way to be able to see that is to realize that uh, it doesn't actually have to be that way. We as human beings can be somewhat precise, and sometimes we are. Okay, if we get ourselves into situations where it's important to be precise, we can do that. One of them that comes up is when like, uh, lots of lives are at stake. So if you look at, for example, what happens in an air traffic control setting. Okay, a lot of lives are at stake there. Human-to-human -human communication needs to be precise. It needs to be correct. And we change our behavior to make that happen. And we get things like this. We get a conversation like uh, Delta 452 four, descend to 11,000. Delta 452 is leaving flight level 270 for 11,000. Okay, what is that? Okay, it's unnatural. <laughs> uh, and I think we can basically turn that on its head and say, uh, if we want to be natural, we need to avoid things like this. And in fact, we need to stay away from being precise uh, and unambiguous. And if we want naturalness, it intrinsically involves uh, being uh, ambiguous and consequently some uncertainty. 
Now, so I want to say that overall, wh while we tend to think about ambiguity as error or weakness uh, or something that you know is wrong, in fact, it, uh, this ambiguity from a human perspective serves particular positive purposes, and getting rid of it is actually a step backwards. Okay, so uh, one one positive purpose is just performance uh, reasons. We uh, are ambiguous. We are basically as ambiguous as we can get by with in order to do things that uh, involve creating grounding uh, and other things that allow us to have very short utterances and be very quick about things. Um, another is uh, social uh, discourse. Social discourse tends, uh, which is very central to natural human-to-human -human interaction, is what we want to do, it is what we naturally do. It relies very heavily on ambiguity and uncertainty for positive purposes, uh, for creating soft boundaries uh, between things. The r social rules that are there are not hard and fast rules, they are soft rules, and in order to do that there must be ambiguity. Uh, and it leaves room to negotiate. And negotiation is something that's important when, in fact, we're doing uh, things that uh, it sort of turns around on itself, but when we're doing things that involve uncertainty, we need to uh, not just simply act on what we think we've got, but we need the person to essentially have closed loop control and negotiate uh, where that uh, stuff goes. Okay. So I will claim that uh, to succeed with natural interaction, and this is really across the board in lots of these uh, different modalities and domains, we need to handle ambiguity uh, and, un and uncertainty well. It's not going to go away, and in fact I will claim that it can't go away and still be natural. All right, But we currently don't know a lot about uh, how to handle uh, inputs uh, and interaction with uncertainty. Again, think about what happens if uh, this signal that says the left mouse button went down is wrong 20% of the time or even 10% of the time. Uh, our current structures for understanding how to write interactive programs and how to deal with uh, the, the inputs that come from them are, uh, are uh, insufficient to really handle that. Okay? And therein lies a research agenda that I think is cross-cutting uh, and points to what I would like to suggest. Okay. Well, so what does that mean specifically uh, in terms of creating a specific agenda? Well, let's look, one way to do, uh, deal with that is to look at what needs to get built. All right, and in fact, it turns out that most interactive programs, maybe all interactive programs, can be boiled down to something that roughly looks like this. You have some input, uh, you have some output. You need to take that input and uh, take the raw uh, uh, indication of what happened as input and interpret that in uh, internal terms. That interpretation of what the uh, user was doing as a sequence of inputs needs to be translated into a set of actions and into, uh, into some feedback that gets uh, produced back to the user as output. Uh, those actions go to the application. The application can, in turn, produce feedback. Okay? This diagram actually covers a, a huge raft of potential interactive systems. And in fact, we can just sort of pick apart the pieces of this diagram if you want to think about, well, what do we need to do to deal with uh, Uncertainty, we can basically just point at uh, each of these pieces and say uncertainty needs to be dealt with here, 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 and here. So for example, we need a representation of inputs with uncertainty. Uh, for certain inputs, the event model of interaction, the event model of input uh, has, uh, it, it's, you know, there were competitors in the past, but we have boiled down and we can do pretty much everything in terms of events. What's the equivalent for uncertainty? We need uh, interpretation of these input, uh, uncertain input sequences. Um, again, we can't make uh, an uh, interpretation of these based on knowing exactly what's going on, but we need to follow the uh, probabilities. We need to do choice of action. We need to do feedback of uncertain system and state and depiction of uncertain data. Okay. So looking at each of these, we again need a, a model of input that uh, encompasses uncertainty. How do we represent it? We need to uh, figure out how to track uncertainty to create robust probabilistic estimates of user intent over time. Okay. Now each of these probably has solutions that are sitting out there, but they need to be brought to bear sort of in a generalizable, reusable way. Choice of actions, given multiple interpretations uh, of what the user intent might be that are coming out of the previous stage, how and when should we decide to act? Um, and then finally, we need some feedback about uh, the uncertainty of the system. We need to be able to tell the user what uh, 
It is the system thinks it knows and, and doesn't and uh, provides some mechanism for the user to get involved in that when the system is not uncertain and do that in a way that is still natural, that is smooth. Okay. And um, I think I will see what we, ah, okay. Uh, and then overall there are also some uh, big picture issues. I think this points back to something that Dan said. Um, the conventional UI paradigm is very good at what it was invented for, uh, but the direct manipulation model that goes with it, this is really a model of editing objects of interest, probably doesn't work so well in the presence of uncertainty, or it's not clear that it works that well in uh, everything with uncertainty. How do we keep uh, this model where it works well? I think this notion of we're just going to wipe uh, the slate clean and start over is not such a great one, because it works well the existing model. How do we manage to not throw the baby out with the bathwater and mix it with uh, a new, new styles and then what are those new styles? Okay. And so overall I want to uh, put forward this notion that uh, there are, although there are lots of challenges in producing natural, inter uh, natural interactions and the natural interaction experience, a lot of them are modality specific. Um, dealing with the un inherent uncertainty of rich new sensors, recognition, and the underlying uh, uncertainty that I think really comes with human beings offers us actually an interesting set of research challenges that cut across all of these things. So as a research topic, um, that's one I think that we should all be interested in. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Scott. So our next speaker, uh, Johnny Lee, is a researcher in the Applied Sciences Group here at Microsoft. Um, Johnny's expertise is in novel input-output systems, um, notably projection displays, um, augmented reality, brain-computer interfaces, haptics. Um, perhaps the thing that Johnny's most famous for, though, is his YouTube videos on how to hack the Wii um, some number of years ago, where he saw over 10 million hits. Um, I've known Johnny for about 10 years now, a little over 10 years since he was an undergrad, and I knew he'd sort of made it when I was um, standing in line at McDonald's one day talking about Johnny Lee, and the cashier looked at me and went, you know Johnny Lee? The Johnny Lee? Um, they offered to give me my milkshake for free, so thanks, Johnny. <laughs> That's how I'm contributing to the world. Uh, uh, so yeah, on the, on the list of things that I've done, I can sort of add sort of computer vision to my background because I sort of became an ad hoc computer vision person for Project Natal, which has been my focus for the past two years. Um, so I'm not going to actually talk much about this project particularly, but sort of my experience working with this because yes, this is a computer vision problem, but this is also a pretty nasty HCI problem as well. And I was probably a lone HCI person in the entire division. Um, uh, so this is going to be kind of an abstracted observation about this project, things I learned about this project, and how it applies to other things I hear within the company and enthusiasm. Uh, now, I'm going to start off like a good researcher and talk about Moore's Law. And we've all seen this kind of graph, the sort of exponential supply of computation for some given amount of cost or space. Um, now, what's not usually put on this plot is the capacity of human attention, which for the most part hasn't changed very much over the past few hundred years. The number of words we read per minute, the number of words we speak per minute, the number of pixels that we can see hasn't really changed. Uh, and if you actually look at a modern computer, this is actually stolen from Patrick Bowdish, which is if you actually look at how much computer is in a modern computer, there isn't very much computer in the computer anymore. The form factor of our devices across any type of genre of device is largely dominated by the UI, the UI, the input and output hardware. And so even if Moore's Law continued at, 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 at infinitum and computation and storage fell to a zero footprint, our form factor of a laptop-like device won't change very much. And so what this does, this sort of crossing graph, if you're taking any basic economics, there's an oversupply of computation. And so in my opinion, this results in an exponential growth in the, in the or an exponential, beyond exponential explosion in the diversity of computing devices that we can supply. We sort of exceeded what most people really need in their device, and so now it make, becomes more economical to make very diverse devices. Um, so that's why four years ago, a $100 laptop was a dream. Now it's a good day at Best Buy. Um, and if you talk, if you, one company in particular, has sort of introduced a new device to say, there is a hole in your computing ecosystem and we're going to fill that now. Uh, 
But in reality, this is more representative of the current ecosystem. Uh, you know, um, uh, there was a claim that computing is getting smaller, but in my opinion, computing is just getting more diverse, and there's becoming a wider spectrum of things that we what we use. Now, what's interesting is that the desktop metaphor, for the most part, is only optimal over this range of devices, this human scale range of devices. And we, there's a lot of enthusiasm around touch and stylus within, inside the company as well as outside the company. And uh, for the most part, touch and stylus input are optimal really only under small devices where there's a premium on real estate. You either have to choose a bigger input or a bigger output, but a nice touch screen sort of allows you to double uh, double duty that physical space and as you get bigger and real estate gets smaller the value of touch and styluses goes down and actually motion and remotes become more valuable once you get to the very large devices and ironically small devices start becoming interesting again as remotes for our big devices and as you can see there's a lot of commercial enthusiasm including Microsoft on entering the living room space in that particular form factor for those particular scenarios and the other thing that's worth pointing out, and when you lay out devices like this, is that we typically, at least in the popular media, there's a lot of focus on getting away from the desktop metaphor, or at least that's what they call Nui when they talk about speech, gesture, um, touch input. Um, but production is largely done over this scale of devices, which happens to be approximately the same scale of devices that we use desktop metaphors for. And that's why we still assume that the desktop metaphors still around, even though I would argue it's actually a minority of the computing devices that we use today already. And consumption tends to be the inverse of this across general population. So the desktop metaphor, the mouse and keyboard, is already, in my opinion, a, a minority, a minor part of the way we interact with computers. And it's not going to go away, but it is going to become an increasingly smaller component. And so when people are really excited about talking about the new interface technology like touch, talking about interfaces that deal with multiple people, speech input, gesture input, um, and when we start looking into more sort of emerging research topics like uh, vision-based SLAM or PTAM, uh, facial recognition, real-time tracking, inertial measurement units, uh, head-worn displays or novel optics displays, and then even further out where we talk about electronics on the contact lens, and muscle sensing computing, or sound computing, or brain sensing. The goal of all of these devices, regardless of what technology they're using and what approach they're using, is that their goal is to capture the intent of the person. And, but this does not come for free. And when I talk to product divisions inside of Microsoft, as well as people outside of Microsoft, there's this idea that, oh, we'll just make a touch screen, we'll just make a gesture, we'll make it sound. And there's an assumption that if you just throw the technology at it, it will come. Um, but in reality, a user experience can be roughly described as the probability of success times the benefit of that minus the probability of failure or misrecognition times the cost. And I think a lot of people, when they watch Minority Report, think about the left side and they forget about the right side. And that's the harsh reality when you watch user studies and watch things like early versions of Natal to completely crash and burn. Uh, so it's important to remember the right side of that when at least talking to people about this, because ideally, the people in this room and, and peers of ours would be considered HCI experts. But when we talk to product people, we should make sure we're aware that sometimes they may come at us with this sort of glossy-eyed, oh, we'll just throw this new technology at it and it'll work. Because if you think about a technology and you think about all the possible user scenarios the technology may be in, you know, either your mobile phone inside a car, your uh, air, an airplane cockpit, or you're at your desktop, a given technology is only good over some subset of those user scenarios. And it's an application's goal to make sure the person starts within that range, good operating range, ends in that good operating range, and not only have the start and end, but the entire journey move through a good operating range. And one of the problems actually with computer vision, if you actually take a pure computer vision approach to it, um, you tend to think of things in a uh, open loop manner, which is we classify a bunch of images, we track people, we output skeletons. But HCI, as Scott pointed out, is a tight feedback loop where your classification accuracy gets tested every single frame. And people tend to gravitate too quickly to failure states. And if the application doesn't take advantage of that or doesn't design around that, uh, that you, have a, you expose a lot to the user. So good experience, good user experience just largely comes through design. And it's a, limit, it's a good marriage between technology limitations and the applications for what it's used for. And so this broad reaching new tech interface technology is a myth. Uh, and in fact, the, the love child of touch input uh, is still only less than 1% of the, 
of mobile phones and is less than 0.1% of all computing devices. So we're, in my opinion, not entering an era of shrinking or increase, uh, an era of touch or gesture. We're just increasing, incre entering an era of specialization and diversification in our devices. So this only comes through good hardware, software, and user experience design. Now, I don't think that's too controversial, but I was going to add a couple slides to, well, what does this mean to academic HCI research? And this is where I might ruffle some feathers. Uh, just based off my experience working with the product teams and what my experience working with some researchers in this area, which is the number of academic researchers working in u new UI technologies is on the order of hundreds. You know, you take the people in this room, you take WIST, you take the subset of Kai and Ubicomp and Tabletop, there's maybe less than a thousand, I think, is, is a reasonable estimate. But even within the company, and we think about all the other companies combined, as well as the enthusiasts, the number of people we're working on new interface technology is on the order of tens of thousands. So academics adding a few drops of experimentation onto this massive bucket of a parallel experimentation is really not that valuable, in my opinion. Um, and so what well-funded research projects should be is about focusing on problems that enthusiasts really can't. And for the most part, this means new algorithmic capabilities. For example, in Natal, new speech, new tracking, new recognition technologies, new gesture mapping, gesture recognition technologies. They should be new, new, new sensor designs, new emitter designs, new optical designs, or even new materials that you can make devices out of that most people can't explore. So that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Johnny. So our last speaker and our closer, uh, Michael Medlock, is a senior experience researcher in the entertainment um, experience group at Microsoft. Um, Michael's been an evangelist for the rapid iterative testing and evaluation, or write method, for a number of years. This is a method that's fairly commonly used in the usability community these days. Um, over the last 13 years, uh, Michael's worked on commercializing various cutting edge technologies um, and has worked on over 60 game titles. Um, to which he sort of sheepishly says half of which have not shipped, <laughs> uh, which, which is actually pretty impressive to me because it means that the other half has. Um, take it away, Michael. Thanks. Um, so can you hear me? Is that, yeah, I can hear myself now. Uh, one of the things I know about the people who have spoke before me uh, and the people in this room, uh, some of whom I know, is that you have either made or will make some pretty killer stuff, right? Some pretty killer new things uh, that will shape the future of computing. But the other thing I know about many of the people uh, in this room is that at some point, you will be frustrated as hell that you can't get your great stuff to be commercialized, right? And I've seen it up close and personal uh, working here for about 11 years. I've been fortunate enough uh, to be at least in Microsoft, on the tip of the spear of some of this stuff. And all I'm going to talk about today is just some personal experience on why the heck that is. I'm not going to claim it's all the reasons. I'm not going to claim that the reasons are good. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the enemy, uh, if you will. Um, oh, wrong way. So, and some of these will probably be pretty obvious, and some of these will be a little less obvious, uh, especially to people who are in industry. So the first reason is that it seems like it's pretty obvious to me, but isn't always obvious to everybody, is risk tolerance. And when you talk about risk tolerance, this is what you're really talking about. You're talking about money, right? Businesses are about making money, like this one, right? And so you can usually follow the money, and you can start to get to the bottom of why some things are happening and other things aren't. Like maybe your great idea isn't taking hold so well or as well as you think it should. So specifically, if you look at this business, Microsoft, um, there are very established things where we are making lots of money. And there are some very new things, uh, some risky things, where we're making no money whatsoever. And I don't think it's a great shock that it's much easier to get your cool new ideas, or anybody's cool new ideas, into places where you're not making any money. Because when you're already making money, why do you want to upset the flow of money? And this gets even more true when you start doing this with operating systems. Because they're a platform for making more money. Once you own that platform, why do you want to disrupt it? Of course, 
you know, I'll step back and say the problem with that thinking is it can be a lodestone around your, uh, you know, around your, your neck. Um, but nonetheless, it's true. Um, so for things like windows, we've got this great big moat around the castle, right? And this moat around the castle is all these applications that work pretty darn well, just as some of uh, my panel colleagues have talked about the mouse interface, you know, and the, and the keyboard interface. They work pretty well, and they're working right now. We, we own that, right? Why would we want to threaten that uh, by introducing new stuff, right? That's one way you could look at it. Of course, the folks, myself as well, in the room look at, hey, that might be coming to an end, you know, someday. It might be being threatened, but, but just understand that. It's a risk tolerance kind of thing. So you have to understand that when you're approaching different businesses. What is their their willingness to accept risk. Uh, and if I go back you know, a screen, obviously there's some places where you're going to be a heck of a lot more willing than others. Uh, when I was in games, they were always willing to accept a lot of risks because most of them weren't making any money. Uh, that, you know, the thing that was said before about how many games that I was on that never saw the light of day, well, that's just true of the games industry. You know, half of them go out of business. Actually, probably a lot more than half of them go out of business, the truth be told. So just something to know going in when you're pitching your idea. This was already touched on by Johnny, um, competition. Here we are, researcher with lots of ideas, lots of good ideas. But then there are the other researchers out there with all their ideas, right? And then you have intrepid person working in the company, and they have their ideas. But here's the problem. Right? Just like Johnny said, there's lots of them. It's a massive number of ideas. But that's not the most important thing, I think, to understand here. It's this next part. How do these people inside the company make money? How do they make money? In my experience, the way they make money is they get one of their ideas to impact the product they're on. That's how they make money. And that's what you're really competing against. You're really competing against the decision makers who are in a product trying to pitch their own ideas. And I'll talk at the end about, uh, this isn't, you know, I don't want to make this all sound gloom and doom. I think there are definitely ways, you know, to, to, to get it in there. Just, just understand, you know, that this is, a, this is a truth of, you know, working within companies. The next one we've got to talk about is timing. And this is pretty important, too. Products are on life cycles. When they get to a particular point within their life cycle, uh, they really aren't going to listen anymore. Uh, so here we have a theoretical, completely made up timeline with some new ideas coming in, zinging left and right you know, at, this, at this timeline. Because as we all know, it's really hard to schedule great new ideas. But the products don't care, because they do have to schedule things in order to ship. Back to money, you know, again. So the reason that this is important to realize is that not only do you have to look at the risk tolerance of the product you're trying to pitch to to make it most appropriate, you also have to think about when you're going to hit them. And you also have to think about um, being persistent. And you know, if you missed it the first time, go in after them again. Don't, you know, don't give up, because product cycles will come around again, often, usually, hopefully. Um, <laughs> another one, this, this is one I hear more on the, I hear this from a lot of PMs and developers that, that I work with, and that's scope, and that is um, somebody will have made some a great thing, some great code that does a great you know, interaction uh, or something else. Seems fantastic, everybody agrees. But then when you, the more you start picking at it, the more you start looking at it, the more you start having to integrate it into your platform, or even if you're building it from scratch, it turns out that this thing, wow, this is, this is a lot bigger, a lot bigger than we thought it was, a lot, more, a lot more difficult to integrate this thing than we thought it was. And the bigger it gets and the more schedule, uh, the, the longer the schedule goes, the more people start thinking about things like cutting it you know, and getting rid of it. So again, making sure that this thing is prioritized appropriately and scoped appropriately and that you can help them, that's a key thing, that you can help them, is probably pretty critical to trying to mitigate uh, this particular thing. And the final one that I'll talk about, which many others on the panel have already talked about, um, and that is a lot of these great new ideas 
sometimes they really are way before their time, and that's, you know, that's just the way that goes. Uh, but sometimes they're kind of predictably bad um, or predictably not so great. Uh, and I'm going to echo a theme that, that I've been hearing with, my, with my, my other panelists here. And that is, here at Microsoft, we have a, a bit of a history of slapping things on, right? Taking, taking interaction models and slapping them on the old ones. Why might that be? Many of the other reasons that I've just been talking about. Like, for example, uh, the risk tolerance. Right? Unfortunately, what I would claim is that sooner or later, some of those things come back to bite us in the rear end, like one just did <laughs> not so terribly long ago, um, which is why I was on Windows Mobile. Um, and for a while, we were trying to support um, D-pad interaction, uh, stylus interaction, and oh, kind of, yeah, sort of finger touch interaction. And we were trying to make an interface that would work for all of them. And so rather predictably, uh, it worked kind of badly for all of them, rather than working well for any particular one. And as a result, you know, we went through a very, very, very painful process of going back through and re-architecting the whole thing uh, for Windows Phone 7, which is well architected for the one thing, and that's finger touch. Right? But this is a story that repeats itself and again and again and again, and that you have to attack early in the life cycle uh, of a product. Um, and I'm not going to suggest that the only way to um, attack this problem is that you only make it for one input modality. I do think, to somebody else's point, that you do have to make it authentic to its input modalities. I do think there is danger in too much duplication of using many different inputs to try to do the same thing. I put this picture up here because it's, you know, it's, our good old, it's our good old mouse, right? And what does it have on here? It has two very different input modalities. That lovely little wheel uh, that somebody added to a mouse that does something completely different you know, than what the mouse pointer did. They, they are very complementary. They work very well together. It seems like most mice in the world have something like this. I, I think this is a lesson you know, for many of us when it comes time to doing or using these new input modalities about how they can be complementary and not overly duplicative. I think that is a big danger that, uh, again, I see over and over and over. And I watch failing in the lab. Um, and I'm thinking about some of the Connect stuff, too, <laughs> when I think about that. Um, but it's not just the Connect stuff. I've seen it, I've seen it for Windows uh, Mobile. Uh, you know, I've, seen it, I've seen it in Windows realms. I've seen it in games. I've seen it a lot. Um, so yeah, it is. It's a big lesson. Um, so I'm not claiming I know all the answers you know, to how to combat this. These are, these are some, of our, some of the dragons that we get to go slay as we try to commercialize uh, the great ideas. One of the ones, you can read this slide as easily as I can read it to you, so I'm not going to. Um, the thing I'm going to really harp on since I'm short on time is the competition part and the giving away the credit. I think it's really important to understand, again, how the individual decision makers really do uh, get ideas into products. So they are much closer than often you, I, will ever be into commercializing these stuff into products. So they have to feel ownership of those things. And what that means is that we often have to give our ideas away and be comfortable giving our ideas away, and frankly, at the time, not taking credit for it having that idea to begin with, even though we all know full well we may well have done that. right? And that often, this is one of the best ways uh, that is kind of counterintuitive to get your ideas into a business, is that you go, you work very deeply and very closely with decision makers. You identify who those are, and you're giving your ideas away. You are constantly saying, ah, it's not mine. It's all yours, you know, really. Um, I'm, I'm just hoping to see something great. Uh, I think this kind of attitude is really, really important. And I think uh, it tends to be very well received um, because then you're making them look great. People tend to like that. Um, that's it. Thanks. So at this point, I'm going to invite all the panelists up on stage. Um, let's go ahead and get you guys in speaking order, roughly, I guess. 
So, uh, yeah, all the way to the end. It'll just make it easier. Uh, just to remind you, we had Daniel Wigdor, uh, followed by Dan Morris, Scott Hudson, John Ely, and then Michael Medlock. Um, and if you guys really can't remember that, you can refer to them by number if you like. <laughs> <laughs> there, <laughs> Bachelor. <laughs> Researcher number two. Um, there are mics running around. If you guys uh, could raise your hand, um, introduce yourself with your name and affiliation, and then fire the question away. Go ahead. Andy Van Dam. OK, it is working. Yeah. All mm. right. So uh, it's always nice to agree with a panel. Uh, but I want to add a couple of things. First of all, no one seems to remember that multimodal interfaces are deep in our past. Put that there from 1980, voice plus gesture, uh, or a bit more recently, uh, Phil Cohn and his collaborators on Quickset, which was pen plus voice. And so the idea of multimodal interfaces and in particular, the thing that Phil and Sharon and others wrote about unification of these non-deterministic, probabilistic input channels is an idea that I think needs a lot of elaboration and gets insufficient play. Scott, the way to deal with uncertainty is to combine uncertainties and have them mutually reinforce each other. Sure. And we don't have very many good examples be besides what we saw in, in Quickset. Uh, another comment is that the whole idea of a natural user interface needs to be put more into context. This morning we were told it's a natural interface if you can walk up to it and without any instruction start using it. I claim that is a very limited definition of what natural means. And if you hand a violin to someone who's never touched one before, that isn't going to be experienced as a very natural user interface. Whereas obviously in the hand of a violinist, it becomes an extremely natural user interface. So what is the learning curve? And are we talking about novices or more experienced people when we say natural? Finally, uh, a lot of people have talked about the need to address intent. And that is where the action is, clearly. But I think if we really want to talk about intent, we have to go beyond intent expressed in whatever form of direct manipulation the user is providing. Uh, my way of thinking about intent is to think about one of my favorite authors, P.G. Wodehouse, and the inestimable Jeeves. Now, Jeeves not only guesses the intent of Birdie, Jeeves is the perfect butler, for those of you unfamiliar with the stories. But more importantly, he can anticipate Bertie's intent and not just essentially uh, perform his wishes, but anticipate what is needed. And I submit that for the ultimate natural user interface, we have to have some of that human ability to anticipate, which is based on a really rich and deep understanding of the context of the user. End of sermon. <laughs> <laughs> what was the question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually, I, I want to comment that I agree with a lot of what you said. And one of the frustrations I had working with the Xbox team is I, can't, I don't think I can name a single person in the entire division that has seen the put that there system, even though that's what we're shipping effectively. Um, and similarly, they're not familiar with probabilistic interfaces and you have game developers who are used to I press I have an if statement bound to the A button now I need to recognize a swing across a wide percent of the population of which I can only test a small percentage and then uh, will only track properly for less than 100% and um, it's uh, it's frustrating but it's also challenging as well um, but th that I guess that was sort of along the lines of why the number of experimentations I've seen them go through and the number of iterations, just because there's so many of them, has far exceeded ideas that I've seen in the academic research. And some of them were, many were reinventions, a lot of new ideas came about. And I could argue that they should have done their homework, but I don't know if the time they would have spent actually pouring through all those papers would have actually been productive given they only had three months to figure out this whole thing. 
Can I respond to one other thing Andy said? Yeah. Uh, on, the, on your second point about uh, sort of natural in the first 10 seconds versus natural in the long run, uh, I, I think as we get to try to define natural in that two hours later, two days later, I think one thing that may be understated in all of our presentations and in this discussion in general is the role of what we might call ergonomics. That is kind of what feels comfortable after you've been doing something for a while. And I don't mean ergonomics just like preventing carpal tunnel. I mean what, after you've been doing something for n hours, are you both physically and cognitively fatigued? And that's going to be a very subjective thing. And you won't be able to say ergonomics is the reason that interface wasn't natural. But I think as we get away from this, is it immediately intuitive and start to think what natural is in the long run, I think we'll be cycling back to what we might call more the science of ergonomics to address that issue. I do want to say one other thing. I just happened to read a little thing from Norman on translators um, from interactions. I don't know if any of you saw that, but it reminded me a lot of, of something you just said, which is there's this huge body of knowledge that sits in all of your heads and that we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. I mean, and, and I'm, I'm in the field. You know, and, and I find myself often not knowing it. There is a huge need for synthesis. It's just an absolutely gigantic need. So if, if I had a request to some folks out there besides myself, is that synthesis is a real activity um, in research practice. And it's hard, and it's really valuable. Uh, it's why some people also get a little famous because they go and they do it. And then everybody throws rocks at them. No, you, you, you misinterpreted my stuff, blah, blah, blah. But it's so useful you know, for, for people to do that kind of thing, to be able to do that kind of work. Let's take uh, Patrick up front and then Ben up back. <clears throat> One, two. Okay, so Patrick Baudrush, Hasselblatt Institute, formerly Microsoft Research. Um, this is a great panel. I really enjoy this. Um, he just says that because we used his figures. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for using my figures. Um, we all know him. <laughs> so I, I didn't know if I should ask that question as like someone who is still feels Microsoft as someone who got out of it. But um, there's a really important discussion here, and I think especially Michael it really kind of talks out of my soul here a little bit um, with this discussion about productizing things. So. Over a couple of, like many, many beers over the years, I've had this discussion if the strategy to make one product that tries to kill it all, if that's the, if that's a sustainable answer to the question. And I mean, you basically said, you know, for a long time we tried to do this, where we had like, you know, it was a Swiss army knife that had to support input modalities, and consequently couldn't do that as well as others who chose to, to define one. I, I think I congratulate, you know, ev everyone who's come to this conclusion, clearly this is not sustainable, but then the next question is, given that at the same time we're talking about natural and, you know, as we all agree, natural means something very different for different people, um, wouldn't the logical consequence be to kind of fork out and actually say we're making different products? So as an example, a couple of years ago I was visiting Adobe. I'm kind of, since Andy talked for so long, I feel like oddly entitled to do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was visiting at Adobe and I remember they did, they did Photoshop Elements at the time. And I think they did a spectacular job at making a version of Photoshop that I, as a professional Photoshop user, cannot use, right? They took a couple of key features out, so they're not losing any of their Photoshop market. They managed to take out, like, you know, layer masks and stuff like that. So, so they're not losing me as a customer, but I think they did a fantastic job at making a product that will be bought by, you know, people in my family who, who spend, you know, less than, like, you know, 500 hours a year on Photoshop. Um, so wouldn't that be a strategy too? Like to just say like, you know, on all these devices we need to, you know, make three versions of Word, um, you know, instead of changing like the main interaction paradigm of, of, of the Word interface after we have, people have used it for like 30 or whatever, 20 years or however long it's been. Wouldn't the same hold for mobile devices? Keep sustain the lines that we have but add new lines that address a new user. Thank you. I can and say and any answer would be Yeah, uh, it's funny you should say that. Before I came to this panel, I was with the people who are doing some of the redesign for Office, for Touch, for new devices. And that's exactly the way they are thinking. Exactly. <laughs> 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 I mean, uh, what can I say except that I, I can't speak for everybody else, but, or Microsoft for that matter, just for myself. I completely agree with you. It's obvious. <laughs> it, it's like uh, to me, and sometimes it bothers me uh, at times how obvious it is, and that sometimes we're a bit slow, you know, to react on that. Um, but then again, it's part of our job to demonstrate 
that obviousness at times to um, a company whose risk tolerance in some places are low, right? Um, Make one, one counterpoint, though. Uh, so no one will argue. So clearly, this trend towards specialization uh, will, will provide fruitful research. It will provide commercial success. Uh, and maybe we have the, as we, uh, both research and product community has been chasing this one user interface, one interaction paradigm for all for, for a long time. We didn't quite get there. Now we're recognizing specialization. In some ways, though, specialization may be the low-hanging fruit. I think, obviously, it's easier to solve individual problems, maybe just so uh, as academics, it may still be our job to keep our eye on the, maybe there is still out there the big picture of one computing paradigm for all. And it doesn't mean just because we've seen commercial success and specialization that it's time to give up on the you know, sci-fi visions of the early 70s where computers were driven solely by speech or whatever it is that was the one computing paradigm for all. You know, just keep our eyes out there. It might, it might still be there. We shouldn't give up on it just because of the clear commercial success that benefits from specialization. But you know, there's, there's a cost to the diversity that Johnny's talking about. Um, producing three platforms costs a lot mm -hmm. more than producing one platform. Um, um, that, are you sure about that? As an academic, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I was thinking I'm the least one yeah. who should be saying this, but, <laughs> but to me it points to a research issue, which is we need underlying tools which make it a lot easier to create more diverse things. We have tools that make it really easy to create the thing that we make a lot of. We need mm -hmm. much more general Tool underlying tool. tools, as somebody who does toolkits. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. Actually, that was a big part of uh, when Windows Phone 7, before uh, we reset, before the iPhone launch, uh, <laughs> uh, before we reset, that was one of the driving factors, the thing that you just said right there, which is cost. You know, for application developers, it would cost a lot more, cost a lot more, to make two different applications, one for touch, one for non-touch, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I don't know. I don't claim to know the answer you know, here. But it just seems to me that by introducing specialization, diversification, we've done a pie expanding thing with, with our development. I mean, I've just, I've just seen this explosion of new developers out there, new people invested in development, new people wanting to become developers, uh, which is, I'll be transparent it surprised me a little bit. Um, this is another thing that I find myself wondering in the cost equation, you know, about uh, specialization versus unification. It, it feels like specification has, has started to allow this great, I don't know, this, it, it seems to have grown the development community. And, I'm, and maybe I'm misinterpreting that because, you know. I think it has. A couple more questions cashed up. Ben? Uh, thank you, Ben Schneider from University of Maryland. I I'm delighted to hear and see this vast effort being applied on the, you know, bold new initiatives and the theme, the term natural user interfaces is an acceptable one. There's been a lot of, there's a dozen similar terms that have been coined over the years. But the, the you know, the idea of direct manipulation was motivated by two deep philosophical issues. The first was to counter the notions of artificial intelligence and make assert clearly that it was the user who was directly manipulating the objects of, uh, the objects of interest, so that they were taking the action. And the assertion of user centrality and enhancement of human capabilities was, was really the first key thing. The second driving force was a, a genuine need to redesign the interfaces to serve user uh, capabilities, and it was the shift from the command line interface that required recall and creation and formulation of commands to a more uh, environment where recognition of the visible objects of interest was the, the key paradigm. And that was, I think, you know, those two things made it appealing, dramatically successful, and also enabled more people to innovate and take it a new direction. So my question to you is sort of where, uh, I've heard a lot of technology push ideas. In, and, they, and they may yet come to pay off. And technology push can be a driver of innovation. But I'm going to provoke and sort of and say, what is the human pull that's going to make this happen? What are the needs that are currently unserved by the existing interfaces? And I'll suggest that there are two. And maybe the way to start is a particularly elegant interface is this one on the new Sony uh, 
uh, it, you know, CyberShot. It's the, a special model, but it's a remarkable and particularly effective version of the so-called solid user interface, one of the ideas that's been promoted over the years. And with a single hand, I can control the entire operation. And by multiple presses, I can get what's going on. I can get what I need done. And it gives me continuous feedback about my current status and what the implications are. So it gives me a clear sense of where I am in an enormously complex environment. So the, this conference is built around the theme of embracing complexity. I guess I'd rather call it conquering com complexity or reducing complexity. But I think that's one thing. The technologies we are getting have enormous capabilities that are vastly complicated. And we need to get an integrated approach to deal with the complexity and make it simple. Now, the nicely integrated second driver is the need to satisfy multiple levels of users, from the novice to the more expert. And Patrick also suggested the idea of several layers. And we've talked about these layered interfaces. I call them karate interfaces, from you know, white belt up to black belt. And I think there's the need to structure the interface so that the novice can get the easy things done rapidly and the more proficient user may have a few more clicks, but they can deal and cope with and amplify their capabilities with that kind of complexity. So uh, I'll say my two votes are that the, the driving things will be uh, levels of skill and the complexity of the environment we have. And I'm sort of coming to you and sort of saying, what are the driving forces from the user side that motivate what, what are you trying to accomplish? Can I give my, my brief response? Yeah. I would say, in the user's mind, does this make me look cool to my friends? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and does it, is it appealing or fun for whatever reason it is? Does it make me? Does it actually let me accomplish the task first? Like to some degree, like we can we can pretend that there's some theoretical or principled drive behind why user interface technology is now becoming pushed so heavily in the market, but it really is just product differentiator, and consumers have voted with their dollars. So, but what is the problem that consumers have that require us to build a new interface? What's not working? Well, I, I think, I don't know if this is on. Yeah. I think one of the challenges that we face a lot, and, and I speak as someone who is in the research community, went over to the product world for a little while, is that the classic WIMP GUI is Turing complete. And so anything, and so is any other user interface that we build on top of a computer, right? There's no state that I can induce with um, one of these new technologies that I can induce with a mouse and keyboard that I can induce by punching, you know, things on my tape. So I think Johnny's point is really well taken, that it's about creating demand and, and the sort of emotional response that people are having to the technology. But I think one of the points that you made earlier is really hitting on it when you talk about direct manipulation. The modern... Um, interpretation of direct manipulation is the sort of physical manipulation metaphor. And I, I was actually sort of hoping you were in the uh, audience when we were talking about it, because you're, you're really getting at this sort of um, chasm that exists between some of the people who are working in this field. Some believe that the goal is to take away the obligation or the um, user interface from the user and to have the sort of anticipatory um, process or that I, you know, contextual computing, and others believe in this this much more, you know, human augmentation, Engelbart vision for computing, and I think that what um, what we really need to start to to do is to classify these things differently and stop thinking about them as one big notion of natural user interfaces. So I would say that one thing that direct manipulation can't do or doesn't do very well is it doesn't scale from the user's perspective. If I have to touch every single thing that I'm dealing with, which direct <laughs> manipulation tends to push you to, that says that I'm limited as to how much I can deal with. And you know, Ben's shaking his head no, yeah. but. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you know, there's a real challenge. This little Sony with far fewer buttons, I have a Nikon D90, which got a lot more buttons, but this has got much more functionality because the design is so elegant to make a consistent style that allows me to accomplish to deal with the complexity. Yeah, okay, but the, I, I, so I celebrate the designers as a model for, for that st strategy. I think that's great for an interface the size of a camera, even a very complicated camera, but let's talk about an interface the size of something that deals with stuff off the web. I mean, at internet scale. I can't, you can't do the equivalent of internet search one element at a time. 
Direct manipulation also is fairly bound to, at least all the examples I can think of are fairly related to 2D screens with fairly 2D input. Um, as soon as you start moving away from that or to very large screens or to non-planar screens or even environments where you're in a car and you don't really want a screen, it, it, it starts to have shortcomings. I guess, uh, so a user, you asked about user, uh, you know, needs, a, what, what, are, what are they missing, what, what, what aren't we satisfying, et cetera. A thing that just, I, it always tickles at the back of my, <laughs> my head, I don't know what decade it's going to happen or whether it's going to happen in my lifetime, but all these different screens that like, you put up on the screen, like the big, you know, why? Why are, those, why are there all those different screens? Because we have this contextual need to have more or less information at any given point in time of, of the day, you know, where we're at, et cetera. We just, we just have this need to have a bigger, bigger view of it or a smaller view of it, a more discreet view of it. You know, that's a user need to have discretion, to not to be embarrassed you know, by, by our interfaces, like the telephone ringing, like in the middle, something like this. Um, as these things enter our lives more and more and more, we have that need for that, that output to scale very naturally, very easily, I think, personally. I don't know. Yeah. So I saw a bunch more hands, but we're actually out of time, unfortunately. Uh, the panelists will be around for a couple of minutes after this and around the, the faculty summit for the next day or so. Um, thanks for your attention, and thanks to the panelists for their opinions. <laughs>